Today I am going to talk about cell population data cytomorphometry in hematology. This topic is very important for me. In the early 90s, I began to investigate how to use these parameters, the leukocyte morphology, automated morphology, to improve the detection of diseases or to exclude, uh, or to also include the normality and avoid false positive, both false positive and false negatives. And I am going to share with you some of the facts and how that plays a role in the actual hematology diagnosis. Let me share with you my, the presentation I prepared for this conference. Hematology diagnostic today. Today we know we have, uh, this is a, one of the actual cell classifications that I modified. And uh, here we can see the red cells, the platelets in the left, and Today in the hematology analysis, we have a lot of parameters about red cells and platelets size and isocytosis of both, but very few uh, information about the leukocytes. The leukocytes only, we are happy if we can differentiate well them and flag abnormalities, but I, I will always love uh, to have more than that because leukocytes are, as we can see here in the graph, there are a lot of cells and we, we don't count how many abnormal cells from this normal that we have seen, we can see here, we can have. For this reason, I think it's very important to have much more information about granularity, size of the nucleus, size of the cell, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What is, uh, what was the classification of the hematology till now? I think it was uh, something like that. These are the big chronic lymphoproliferative disorders in that we can see that for the diagnosis, we use the morphology here, uh, the, over the uh, morphology, the, the photo of the cells, we can see the, the, the schematic of the cells that comes from the book of Soledad Besner, my teacher in morphology. And after that, we use flow cytometry, we use morphology, cytogenetic, cytochemistry, etc. More B, lymphoproliferative disorders, chronic. T, chronic lymphoproliferative disorders, that we can recognize very easily. Acute myeloid leukemia, different types. B, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. T, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And with that, we were happy till now. In 2016, the WHO published the consensus classification of hematology malignancies, and really that changed everything. And now it's beginning to be applied in many of the hospitals, and not everybody can apply this technology to classify the hematology disorders. Today, we know that the uh, lymphobla acute lymphoblastic leukemia, lymphoma, it's a molecular and genetic classification of these disorders. And really, uh, that is what is relevant today. And for that, we need to do uh, kits like that, a multiplex next generation sequencing kit in that we can see the positivity or not for these genes in that with that we will define the therapy, the clinical trial, the diagnostic and the prognostic of acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Here, the acute myeloid leukemia, we see the actual classification, nothing similar than the previous one that was M0, M2, M1, M2, M3. And the same, after we suspect an acute myeloid leukemia today, we have to do something like that, next generation sequencing, in that we can check the genes and with that to do the therapy, diagnostic, prognostic. MDS, same, we can suspect, and we are going to talk about that, how to suspect MDS from the routine hematology analyzer, and after in the future, you will only have to do a, 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 a kit, a next generation sequencing kit, to see the type of therapy and what you have to do in the prognostic. Same for multiple myeloma, and same for not Hodgkin lymphoma and lymphoproliferative disorders. What is the contribution of flow cytometry in the hematology diagnosis in the next decades? I think will not be the same that now, 
um, the flow cytometry has lost some of the roles, like counting blasts, that now is not anymore permitted for the WHO classification. You need to count it in the, um, with using a microscope, not anymore with flow, because there are many different type of blasts with definitive, very different positivities for different markers, and will be something for a screening for me, in my opinion. Um, sorry for the experts in flow cytometry that don't blame me, but this is what I see. Uh, I am pragmatic. Uh, here we can see four types of diseases from the lymphoid origin. Um, uh, one is normal, that is the top left, is so quite clear, using CD45 site scatter. And here we are using only three monoclonal, CD45, a, a T marker, CD2, and a B marker, CD19. And using these three markers, only three, we can classify quite well and we can do a screening quite well of the lymphocyte abnormalities. In the first one is a normal one. Second, that is in the top right of the slide, we can see an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. B cells are marked in dark blue. And we can see that there are two populations uh, with different intensity for CD45. The blasts that are CD45 dim, not negative, but dim, a very low positive, and the normal B cells that are positive for uh, CD19 and are normal. Uh, the T cells are in light blue, and the, here the neutrophils are not relevant. In the bottom left, here we can see a chronic lymphoproliferative disorder. You can see that the positivity for CD45 is lower, not dim, but a little lower than normal, and um, that is different than a good lymphoblastic leukemia that you can compare. Uh, two uh, B lymphoproliferations, uh, but one is acute and the other is chronic. And the fourth one in the bottom right of the slide is a, a viral infection with an increase of T cells with normal CD45 intensity. Here we can see the diagnosis, a normal BALL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and infectious mononucleosis. Next generation sequencing, according to the WHO, there is a chapter in the WHO that says that in not using uh, this technology, uh, there were many cytogenetic abnormalities that were not found with the classical techniques. And we need to do that today. If we don't do it, we can even do malpraxis because today is not anymore, for example, possible to say only chronic lymphocytic leukemia. That's all. No. You have to say if it's a chronic lymphocytic leukemia uh, with the election of 13, that is good prognosis, or the election of the 11 or 17, that is bad prognosis. You cannot any, or a trisomy of the chromosome 12. You cannot do any more diagnosis of CLL without that because the treatment is different, the prognosis is absolutely different. How we, see, how we see, how I see the future diagnosis of dermatology malignancies? I think, of course, we will need dermatology instruments. They are going to do a screening. And after that, we will decide to do a blood smear or not. And after the blood smear and some clinical features, we are going to decide to do next generation sequencing if we suspect a malignancy. But also we have to do qPCR, quantitative PCR, as we have seen now for infectious diseases that will be much more accurate, will be for sure the diagnosis, and will be the standard one for diagnosis of the hematological disorders. Of course, from the instruments, we will appreciate to have good flagging. Now it's uh, quite a specific flagging, but I would like to have much more specific flagging, even maybe suspect high cell leukemia or suspect chronic lymphoproliferative disorders. I think we need to try to reproduce what WHO is asking. Maybe only multiple myeloma or plasma cell leukemia, only acute lymphoblastic leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, only the non-Hodgkin lymphoma, I think we need to try to reproduce the a classification that will need further uh, analysis with uh, molecular uh, next generation sequencing kits. This is an example, an acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Here in the diff, we can see that the blasts are in the bottom of the um, plot, uh, normal cells with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, correspondent flags. And after we see the morphology and we count the cells. In the future, will not be relevant. I think we will only see the morphology, not counting even the cells, because for that will not be relevant. But uh, 
flow cytometry can do it very well, only counting the approximately the number of abnormal cells. And the myeloid leukemia, as you can see, is different. The blasts are in different position, and that is what I'm going to talk, position of the cells. The position will define many characteristics of the cells. And again, we will have the blood smear that we are going to confirm the diagnosis. And we can count or not. I, I am not against that. We will not have a lot of leukemias to count every day, but will be not really relevant for the treatment and prognosis. And here we have a slide in that we can see the lymphocyte morphology with different type of cells. We cannot do a flag only for each for, for all these cells, say in barrier limbs, I think we need to try, even if we don't report that, even if we give a number only, but I think we need to try to create flagging for each of the abnormal cells. After uh, what we can do with this information, once we have the flagging, we have to use several technologies we are going to discuss in the end of my presentation. We can use, for example, the, the validation decision rules that we can see here. I participated in, in this group creating that. And as you can see here, we have optimizing the best these rules. We have about 3% of false negatives. Is that good? Is that bad? I think when a people is asking me, is 3% enough? I say, okay, how many cases you have per day? 500. Three, four, uh, 500 is 15 cases every day that you are missing. Is that good for you? How we can avoid that? How we can improve the detection of disorders not having a lot of false positive? I think the answer is cell population data. Here is the list of participants in that you can see myself. Cell population data, that is my topic, and that is what I think is necessary to include and to calibrate and to control and to use it much more in hematology. We have here the mean ray uh, values, normal values for one instrument uh, uh, of cell population data, neutrophil X, that is the complexity, the scatter, neutrophil Y, that is fluorescence, neutrophil Z, that is the size of the cells. As uh, we can have all these parameters and including we can have the standard deviation that is not included here, that is the anisocytosis of these parameters. And with that, we can have this, the, all this information from all these cells and to try to classify them. With that, this is an example from Dr. Woro at Alter, published in 2018, in that we can see an approach of different situations, disorders with the different values of cell population data. You can see uh, is in uh, red, um, the high values is in uh, white, is the normal values, is low um, values in uh, light blue, and uh, both light blue, uh, it's the very low values. And you can see that the pattern is different from the majority of the lymphoproliferative disorders, acute lymphoblastic leukemias, acute myeloid leukemias, septic shock, viral infections, etc. The pattern is different, only we need to use the right tool to classify these different disorders. For example, using neutrophil mean fluorescence. This parameter is measuring the, the, we can see here represented in the graph, the neutrophil fluorescence, the mean fluorescence, and that has been published to be uh, useful for sepsis, for infection management, including differentiation of bacterial versus viral infections. Some studies show as good performance as procalcitonin and better performance than CRP, detecting sepsis, for example. And there are many studies about using fluorescence, neutrophil fluorescence, for uh, in different situations, majority infections. These are the reference values for the mine ray instruments. Monocyte Z. Monocyte Z is the monocyte volume. I will discuss that in my COVID-19 hematology analysis uh, talk during this CUBE. 2020, but here we can see that the representation is the other uh, uh, angle of the cube that is mm, the size. The size of the monocytes, it's important for, for example, megaloblastic anemia. I have a patent and articles about that. Infolate deficiency for anemia is also important, the monocyte size, because in macrocytic anemias, monocyte and neutrophils are also big. And we can use neutrophil and monocyte macrocytosis for the diagnosis of these disorders. Um, 
Also, in the detection of COVID, we will see that monocyte set can predict the severe critical phase of the disease. Here, another study that also uh, helped uh, use the monocyte Z uh, com and compare it with C-reactive protein for bacterial infections from Mardi et Alter, published in 2009. The reference values for monocyte forward scatter, monocyte Z, we can see here, and we can see here an example of a normal monocyte and a big monocyte, monocyte macrocytosis that we can see in a case of COVID-19 that we will see in the presentation of COVID-19. The neutrophil Z is the neutrophil size, and as I said, it's helping to detect megaloblastic anemia. Moreover, in addition, when in addition is iron deficiency, because in these cases, the, uh, the MCB can be normal and can be both B12 deficiency and iron deficiency. And many of the cases of B12 are not pure, are combined. And in this case, the MCB is normal, but neutrophil Z and monocyte Z are high. And also can use, uh, can, is, is used a lot, the neutrophil size for diagnosis of sepsis, as we can see in these articles that we can see here. Neutrophil size is important for sepsis. Here we can see the reference values of neutrophil size. Here we can see a normal neutrophil in the bottom right, uh, a big neutrophil and a big neutrophil hypersegmented that the size will be similar, but we will have to see the neutrophil X to combine both to identify and to differentiate between big and hypersegmented and big and not hypersegmented. And here you can see the reference values for the mine ray instruments. Monocyte ZSD, monocyte anisocytosis, I discovered that in the first article published any, any, in any time for cell PD, I published myself the patent to detecting malaria. Monocyte anisocytosis is very important detecting for screening of malaria. It's also important detecting dengue. There are three articles about that. It's a predictor of sepsis and differentiate also reactive thrombocytosis from essential thrombocytemia. Of course, this is all research, not approved by FDA, but uh, this is important. And here we can see a lot of articles about monocyte uh, standard deviation, monocyte anisocytosis. The reference values for the monocyte anisocytosis, we can see here the, these reference values. Lymphocyte size. Lymphocyte size has been very useful too. Uh, and lymphocyte standard deviation for lymphoproliferative disorders is CLL. We can see the small size of lymphocytes that can be used for the diagnosis of or suspect diagnosis of CLL and other lymphoproliferative disorders. And according to the size, the scatter, and the fluorescence, we can, I think, suspect with high probability that is a reactive or malignant disorder. And just using uh, B marker because any B increase of uh, any increase of B cells is malignant. There are only one polyclonal uh, lymphocytosis uh, of the smoking women that is normal, but any increase of absolute number of B cell is malignant. Only with a B marker and cell population data, we can do a quite good screening of chronic and a good. Uh, lymphoproliferative disorders. CD45 intensity will be also very helpful. And here the references talking about that. There are many others. I only mentioned some of them. And the reference values for lymphocyte size. Neutrophil X. Neutrophil X, it's another important parameter. Is the neutrophil complexity. It correlates with the neutrophil granularity. And uh, we can see here three articles about that, how it's correlated neutrophil X and how it can be used for the screening of myelodysplasia. We did another study uh, in Hamburg in Germany uh, to see in the routine applying a different thing, not only classifying MDS, just apply neutrophil X in the routine. And we have seen that 10% of the patients that have received chemotherapy have neutrophil degranulation. Not all of them get MDS, but some of them in the, the, during the next years will develop MDS. For this reason, neutrophil X can be maybe a predictor, we have to explore that, a prediction factor of uh, neutrophil and myelodysplasia. But initially, we can see the granulation in 10% in, in of the patients with chemotherapy that have received chemotherapy. Not all of them will develop myelodysplasia. 
And here you can see the one picture in that we can see a degranulated neutrophil, a normal neutrophil, and the reference values for main ray neutrophil X, that is neutrophil complexity. And after that, for sure, the plan, when you suspect an MDS, maybe also with cytopenias and other of the evolution of the of the cytopenias that will be for several months we can do immediately the kit for that that is science fiction now but i think we need to explore these possibilities to uh, to when of, also of course when this test will be much more available for everybody but that will be for me the future when you suspect mds you will do this kit to uh, screen for the possibility that you have a genetic abnormality together with cytopenia, for sure. And again, here we have the values of cell PD, a lot of parameters. We have the possible application of classification of disorders. We have flow. And the question is how we combine all this information. Qualitative morphology, I don't think will be quantitative. Uh, flow, cell population data. I think, and, and after, to decide or not to do next generation sequencing. I think how we, we can improve the information provided by the instrumentation. I think we need to use expert systems, artificial intelligence. Maybe some of you don't know, but I am a lecturer in the University of Lugano, South uh, Switzerland, um, about artificial intelligence. And I, th I am I'm working with a, a artificial intelligence, an expert system from the 1989. There are three types of expert systems, rules-based, for example, the ICSH validation rules for hematology that try to reproduce an expert. This job was done uh, before that by uh, a doctor uh, that was validating the hematology results. Now it's an expert system that do that. So we have to be familiar because we all of us use uh, expert systems, for example, also for chromatography to, to, to see the peak of gas chromatography and compare with uh, when we have an intoxication to see which poison have caused the problem to the patient. And uh, we compare the peak with a database. This is again an expert system. Uh, neural networks is another method that we can use. All the digital imaging, automated digital imaging used in the world is, is made with neural networks. The recognition of a plate in a parking is also made with neural networks. And Bayesian network based uh, in Bayes in Bayes theorem. Bayesian analysis for me, it's really the one we have to use uh, together with the rules based and neural networks. The rules based, there are rules and meta rules. Why we use meta rules? Because when there are many, many, many rules, many, for example, many rules about thrombopenia, we have to make a meta rule that says, is thrombopenia yes or not? If it's not thrombopenia, we don't have to pass all the rules about thrombopenia, we eliminate them. But the reason, when you have a lot of rules, you use meta rules to uh, focus uh, in the topic. Um, the, the thing is, intuition may seem like a human trick, but machines can be pretty good at it too. Underlying a hunch are dozens of tiny subconscious rules through what we have learned the, from experience. That process was made for the ICSH rules. We were trying to reproduce what the humans we do. And we have several meetings, some matching, myself, uh, Professor Zini, etc., in that we agreed what will be the consensus rules for hematology. We agreed, we double checked that, we make evidence-based medicine, and after that we publish the rules, and many people are using these rules in the world. Example of rules based uh, in, the, in the ISTAT, the international consensus, that every many people is using it. Neural networks. Neural networks looks like very sophisticated, but are not. I, I have the opportunity uh, to use neural networks in the beginning of digital imaging when the micro 21 you have to do to train the, the the instrument yourself and you have to choose your slides to identify them and to make the the system learn from you the system will be as good as you are and that is important 
the a neural network will be as good as the expert that says that finally this was that. If you have wrong diagnosis, the neural network will reproduce the, the, the errors eternally. If you say this is a band and it's not a band, the instrument will not will do it as you are, as you are doing. That is something that we need to know. Uh, the neural networks are as good as the experts that do the, that create the neural networks. That was clear in the Micro 21 when you were training yourself the instrument with your own slides. Neural networks are very sophisticated modeling techniques capable of modeling extremely complex functions. Linear modeling commonly uses the technique of opti to optimize strategies. That is complicated. Let me explain you in a different way. Neural networks are very useful when the subject to predict can only be one thing. For example, neutrophil in a blood smear. For example, automated, automated digital imaging or a car plate entering or existing in a uh, entering or exiting of a parking, but cannot be used when a patient has two or more diseases at the same time. How the neural network can classify two or three or four diseases at the same time? It's practically impossible. You will need to do another method for that, and that is. Uh, neural networks learn by example. The neural networks use gather representative data and then invoke training algorithms to automatically learn the structure of the data. An example, put in a box snails, apples, bananas and peanuts and the system can classify them. For example, here I put uh, a corn, a clock and a, and a button. And you and put that in a box that analyzes several with several detectors, analyze size, color, weight, and can classify quite accurately the the three different objects that you put in this box. The size, the color, the the, the weight permits to classify these uh, these things. But the thing is, these things can be only one. But the, a disease is not the same. A patient can have fever because have tuberculosis, can have um, anemia because have an iron deficiency and can have a colon cancer uh, that uh, and all together can look like a disease but it's not there are three diseases at the same time neural networks uh, as I said are as good as the database you use for to train the, the system uh, and you cannot miss any diagnosis if you don't have Ebola in your database will never make a diagnosis of Ebola that is so you need to be sure that you include all the rare diseases including congenital disease progesis, et cetera, et cetera, that are rare diseases. Pyropoikilocytosis, that is very rare uh, form of homozygotus elliptocytosis. If you don't have it, you will never diagnose that, and that we need to consider that. But are very useful when you have an univoc possibility, like is this a neutrophil? Yes or not. Is this a monocyte? Yes or not. So that are very good. Don't consider when you use it in a patient, because the patient can have more than one disease. Bayesian analysis is my preferred, together with the rules. And it's interesting, the Bayesian analysis were uh, invented, discovered by Thomas Bayes in the uh, 16th century, in, in, uh, in that uh, he dis said something very, very interesting. He was surprised and he said, the more frequent is the more probable. And that is what he said. I explained that very simply to um, to the people, to the to, to my alumns, uh, to the students in the University of Lugano. Imagine I am a doctor, and my my nurse told me, Doctor Simon, you have a patient, and immediately I will think to myself, uh, what can be? Okay, I can make a guess, uh, just analyzing my database of patients. If the patient I don't know if is male, female, old, young. I can guess that maybe has 23% to be a chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Why? Because 23% of my patients have CLL, because my, my consultation is hematology. And with the same rule, I know now that the person is a lady that is 65 years old. Okay, in this group of age, CLL is not 23, it's 42% of probable. Only knowing the age and the gender, I, I can guess how frequent is the probability to be CLL. Of course, if you have lymphocytosis, now the, only with lymphocytosis, only with one parameter, I can guess in my database of patients, only with lymphocytosis will be 73% of probabilities to have a CLL. 
only with one parameter, lymphocytosis. And the thing is, that is amazing, but that is the only method suggested by Harrison Principles of Internal Medicine, the book of medicine we all of us practically have used to learn medicine, is the only one recommended. Because it's not a black box, you can always trigger where it comes from, the relationship between a symptom and a disease. And for example, a Bayesian analysis will work like that. When you have fever, neutrophilia, headache, vomiting, photophobia, skin rash, you have 90% probabilities to have a bacterial meningitis and 10% of other disorders, alone or combined. And that is what how it works. It just calculates the probability based in the facts you have. You have more facts, better. You have cell population data, better. You have morphology, better. You have flow, better. But always will give you a probability of the different possibilities of the disorders. And that's all. I hope that this presentation will be useful for you. I am sorry for the noises because uh, the, the Wi-Fi was not possible to do it in my normal place, but I hope that everybody understood the, and, 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 and was useful for you this presentation. Thank you very much. <music>